series that we've called I Am. It is looking at the seven statements Jesus uh, declared himself to be in the book of John. I mean, actually, if you want to count when he says, like, my, um, he made the statement, I am, just simply I am as well. That might be eight. But we started off with last week, I am the bread of life. And I hope that you've been encouraged. I hope that you've recognized that this walk with Christ is one that we, we, we get sustenance from. I know it, it was hard to explain that message because for most of us, the majority of us, Dying from starvation is not a reality that we face. And so when you hear he's the bread of life, it sometimes can go over our heads as well. And so we treat God almost as a, a dessert more than the daily bread. Y'all know what we're talking about? You might not enjoy the best dessert every day, but you're supposed to enjoy Christ every day. And you got to go to him. He's the sustenance of our life. And so... Man, last week we unpacked that. Hopefully encourage you. I hope some of you spend a little more time every day this past week in his presence. Amen. All right, great. I, I'm happy to hear that. Today I think the statement we're going to look at is a bit easier to relate to. It's taken from John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 12. You can follow along in your worship guide or on the screen. It says, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And here Jesus declares he's the light of the world. What's interesting is, when you think about it, whether you're a, a follower of Jesus Christ or not, when you think, let's just take Trinidad, sweet TNT. When we look around our society, there's a lot of darkness that is happening in our land. There are robberies every day. And, and because of social media, because everyone walks around with a phone, we actually see a lot of the darkness in our land. Amen? I mean, like, if you're not careful, that could mess with your mind. Like, every day you go on social, you're going to be seeing a lot of evil in our land. And they, they're, they're murders every single day that we... We, we can see that is on social media. And here's the thing. If you are like me, a couple years back, this was wrong, but we used to say this, uh, most of the murders were gang-related. Almost like if that made it easier to cope with. But today, we can't say that anymore. People are being killed uh, when they're being robbed. People are being killed for real senseless reasons. Come on, anybody living in the same land with us? And the idea is, here, here, here's the reality. We can see in humanity there's a darkness, there's an evil. Outside of God, man left to their own, we, we live in darkness. Our land is covered in darkness. Man, we could talk about those gruesome crimes, but there's also we see the darkness of greed, exploitation. I wonder if I alone living in Trinidad. <laughs> but here's what the point is this whether you follow Christ or not, seeing evil or associating evil with darkness, we all have that inherent co uh, concept or understanding that there's a darkness in this world. We see people do evil things, whether daily or when it crosses your path sometimes. And Jesus making that statement that he's the light of, of this world, he's the light of your life and my life, gives us an understanding that Christ is the hope for, for the darkness that we see in our land. Amen? In Isaiah 9, ch chapter 9, verse 2, this was the prophet prophesying about the coming of Christ. He said, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And, and this is Jesus fulfilling such prophecy. There were many more. But when Isaiah prophesied, he may not have had the full concept or the full understanding. But Jesus comes and says, hey, I'm the light of this world. 
And so I've got just two questions for you this morning. We're just taking that statement, and the first one that i got to challenge you with is this. Are we walking in spiritual darkness? Are we walking in spiritual darkness? And hear my heart with this. Jesus made that declaration, I'm the light of the world. He says, the one who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. And Jay's coming and asking you, well, are we walking in spiritual darkness? Because the quick response that most of us want to say is that, well, of course not. We, we live and we walk lives following Jesus Christ. So automatically, we should not be walking in darkness. Y'all with me? But here's the problem. From the moment Adam and Eve sinned, and just for context, the first human beings that God created, man and woman, he fashioned them in his likeness. From the first moment that they disobeyed God, that they knew what God's command was, they were put in a perfect environment, full sustenance, they had, it says that God actually came in the cool of the day and walked with Adam. So you have a perfect environment and you have God walking with man in the perfect relationship that God desired men to walk with him with. They disobey God and there's a separation between man and God. And so let me, let, let me say this to, to us. So every person that came after Adam and Eve, we were born into darkness. Why? Because we were born with sin. Come on, y'all with me? I talking to y'all about that wonderful child that I have. But I don't have to teach her how to be disruptive. I don't have to teach her how to be mean sometimes. All right, all right let, let go. Even as adults, we who know better still choose wrong. You don't need to be taught that. Come on. Like, no perfect people, so you're in good company. All right? So don't be afraid to shake your head, say amen, or whatever. The reality is that in every one of us, by default, we were born into this darkness. Spiritual darkness simply means not having fellowship with God through our relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and because we were born in sin, the only reason we have fellowship with God, the only reason we could worship God, the only reason we could run to Him is because for most of us, we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Well, that just sounds like a few of us. But so maybe we need more salvation. But when we, when we think about spiritual darkness, it's easy to look into the world and look at some of the more violent crimes and the most obvious sins. However, Scripture is filled with believers and churches in the New Testament who still practice and lived in darkness. So the first question is, are we living in spiritual darkness? It's not for us to just bypass, but us, for us to examine our own hearts. Here's why. Because if we can find spiritual darkness in our lives, then it leaves the next question, are we really following Jesus? At least the Jesus of the Bible. Y'all with me? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 18 to 19. This is the apostle Paul talking to a church. He says, being darkening their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. Verse 19, and they having become callous, having given themselves Obtain decent behavior for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. So walking in darkness is not only the extremity of violent crimes. But Paul introduces something of a people whose heart was hardened. For people who understood the truth, knew the truth, but chose to be ignorant. Come on. Suddenly we're going to open up the space of what darkness looks like because he's talking to a New Testament church. 
He's talking to a body of believers. And so, how many of us, we've heard God's leading, his voice, his direction. We've read his word where he's brought some truth to us. And we continually rebel against his instruction. And I'm not trying to bring any condemnation, but that's the reality of us hardening our hearts. We've heard God speak to us and we keep delaying it. We keep saying we'll do it this way or that way. Come on. So I propose to you that there are probably more Christians in churches walking in darkness. See, we could talk all we want about outside in the world. The world is going to act like the world. People who are lost, they are going to commit acts of darkness. They are going to behave like they don't have a savior because they don't. But when Christ is saying, I am the light of the world. And Paul is revealing that even within the church, some of us, we know what is right, but we still don't do it. Then we are living in darkness. I, and here's where I think, I remember when we, Sarah and I were youth pastors in our home church. And we took a group of young people. There was a Y1 facility somewhere in Las Lomas. I don't even know if it's still functioning. But we took them on a little retreat. We had to spend the night there. We went up in the day. We had a few sessions. We took the youth group to try and uh, teach our little team building exercises, really impart some spiritual lessons. So we were using the facilities. They had a little retreat house where we would spend the night. But there were activities that we had to do. And one of the activities was in the evening, actually coming into night. And I remember we took the entire group, uh, probably close to 30 kids, probably more maybe. But, and what we were going to do is we would start to go for a hike in the night. Now, there no, this is into the bush, right? No, no lights, nothing like that. And so the guy who's leading the exercise, he's the only one that has a flashlight. And so the first exercise we had to learn was uh, keep your hand on the person in front of you and trust where they're going. And so the person, the one person with the flashlight, he's walking, single file, all of us. I think I, I stayed at the back. We had all these young people. And as he would say, okay, uh, doc, when you're passing here, because he took us through like almost like a little obstacle course, right? Nothing too hard, but. He was teaching us how to rely on the person in front of you. So then we, we go through, we get through that part, and we enter into our open feel like, but it's pitch black. And so as we go in now, it's by now evening has turned to night. You can't see anything. He tells us to close our eyes. Close our eyes really tightly for, I can't remember how long, 20 seconds or so. And every time we reopened, our eyes adjusted. And so we could see a little bit better. You, you, you all have experience, huh? You, you go into the darkness and it takes a while and your eyes adjust to the darkness. Well, I think that's how some of us live as Christians. We've adjusted to the darkness in our, in our lives. We, we, we've, we've seen the darkness that God is trying to talk to and, and, and speak in our lives. And we continue we continue to adjust our lives around it when God wants to address it. There's some of us, we still struggle with unforgiveness. That's darkness. That has no place in the life of a believer. That has no place in the life of someone who's following Jesus Christ. I know, you see, we... Once we start to speak on those things, the darkness doesn't seem so much out there. But, but what Christ wants us to deal with with us today as a community, for those online as well, is we got to look in and see where in our lives we've allowed darkness to stay in, in, our, in our hearts. Romans chapter 1, verses 29 to 32. 
says in people having been filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, and evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unfeeling, and unmerciful. Time out right there. We could find ourselves somewhere in there, yeah? Maybe not as a lifestyle, but there, 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 there's some of that still in some of us here today. But here's what really caught my attention, verse 32. And although they know the ordinance of God, those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but they also approve of those who practice them. For most of us who've been in church for any length of time, I don't have to convince you that you've experienced or come across communities or body of believers that have accepted some form of darkness and they tolerate people who operate with that. Whether it was benefit for the church, whether it was benefit for a leader or something like that. Here's the reality. There are Christians walking around where we've compromised in the holiness that God has called us to. And the danger is not only the darkness in our lives, but we accept people who do the same. And that's why these messages probably won't be as popular and, you know, <laughs> somebody tell me this week, I remind them of Stephen Furtick. I didn't know how to take that. <laughs> Anybody who knows me knows why I say that. There are many of us that we love all the trending things that we want to believe about Christianity. But this series, exploring these statements, if you are going to follow the Jesus of the Bible, then at least follow him based on what he has declared about himself. Because everything else that came after Christ and his resurrection points us back to those things, who he is. And if he is the light of the world, we can't be professing him and still living in darkness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 to 7 says, This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we do what? We do what? We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. There's some of us probably here today that our lives, as much as we want to live right, it's probably a lie before the truth and the light of God. Because there's still darkness. Not darkness we're wrestling with, darkness we've accepted. Darkness that we have actually planned our life around. Or planned enough to ensure that people will not know who we truly are. Amen. Here's the thing that I found really interesting with this verse. He says in 7, If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we don't just have fellowship with God, you know. We have fellowship with one another. We can talk how much we want about unity in the church and talking about building community. But if we don't have the authentic believers who confront the darkness in their own life, there's no way we're going to build that community. We can do activities and we can do lots of things. But if you and I don't take ownership of our own lives, anybody with me? See, we can keep talking about how much we want to be a community. We can talk all about how much we want to live for God. But if there is places that we are compromising in our walk with God, 
then those are the things we need to address. Those are the areas that we need to focus on. Stop talking about what someone else did to you. Stop talking about what they did. And for some of you, it's been years ago, and I, I am not belittling pain or trauma or suffering. But your God is bigger than that. And maybe it's time we started to stop excusing why we're not where we should be and start taking action to who we need to be. Are we living in spiritual darkness? Charles Spurgeon says, if you think you can walk in holiness without keeping up perpetual fellowship with Christ, you have made a great mistake. If you would be holy, you must live close to Jesus. There ain't no two ways to this. That's why we're doing this series. You want to live close to Jesus, but we don't know who he is. We know who our pastor says he is. We know who our leader tells us he is. But we actually don't take the time to know who he is. That's why we're just going straight to the word. I am the light of the world. But then you hear the apostles and the other writers of the Bible remind you that, listen, you can't be walking in light. You can't be following him if you got areas here that's dark. What does the Bible say straight? We lie. So you may never want to have a conversation with me, you know, but you will have a conversation one day with him. And, he will, and no matter how good our image we keep up amongst ourselves, how good we look as good Christians, it won't matter because in him there is no darkness. And the moment you stand before God, it will be laid bare. So we say, do we say we have fellowship with Christ but walking in darkness? See, we don't have fellowship with Christ or even his church. This is how far cultural Christianity has gone. That's why we don't prioritize coming together. That's why we don't want to have fellowship with one another. We okay having fellowship more with people in the world. But we don't want to have the, do the hard work to have fellowship with the brother and sister next to you. And hey, listen, you may, you may be visiting here, then no problem, but go back to your church and invest your life to give off your time, your treasure, your talents, and build genuine, authentic relationships. But to build any relationship, you know what the currency is? Time. Some of you saying, well, you know, I can't connect with people in church. Obviously, because you don't spend time in church. <laughs> All right, that was just a real easy setup. Sorry. <laughs> That was just too easy. But you need to hear the reality. Stop talking about, well, I can't find good all my good relationships outside. Yes, because you invest yourself outside. Then you want to know why we, we compromise in. The world okay with you living outside there. They okay with your darkness. But most of us, that's why we run from the church. All right, all right, that's not the message. Let me go. Second question. Could I can't see that clock too good in the back there, Ole. <laughs> Just two more hours. Don't worry, we're almost done. <laughs> Good, nobody didn't say go ahead and preach, right? <laughs> I love it. You're all practicing shoot right now. Good, good, good. You all ain't going mama guy, man. All right. Second question, if you're taking notes, are we following Jesus? Are we following Jesus? Here's the truth. If God has spoken and convicted you in any moment of this message, that there is still darkness in our lives, then the obvious question is we've got to address, are we truly following him? Because Jesus' words is that if I'm the light of this world, the, he says the one who follows me will not walk in darkness. So if we're walking in darkness... We're probably not following him. Come on. 
I really like it simple. I tell all you, see student all the way. My wife tell me, stop saying I's not the sharpest tool in the shed. She said, reflects poorly for her. <laughs> so it's not the sharpest tool in the shed, but it's the most useful. How about that one? That, that could still pass? <laughs> Listen, it's real simple. If we follow Christ, we will not walk in darkness. So if we walk in, in darkness, I, ha I ask these students here, because nobody <laughs> follow me there, boy. Way. <laughs> all right, I know all they go tell me after. Pastor, we are thinking about it. Here's the thing. We often speak about following Jesus. You hear that in church. If you've been in church for a long time, you're hearing that since you're small in church. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. But what do we mean? The Greek word that is used to follow, akolutin, in Greek, has meanings. It's not one meaning. It has five meanings that come together to paint the picture of what it means to follow. So you know when Mark, in Mark's gospel, this word is used when it says to uh, deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow? That's the word that is being used. But it has five different but closely connected meanings. And I put them there for you. First picture. So when Jesus says, if you're following me, you won't live in darkness. Here's one of the imagery that this word conveys. Because the Greek language is very different from the English language. And so it is a picture of, it is often used for a soldier following his captain. So if I ask you, are you following Jesus? Your life should look like a soldier following his captain. But I'm going to challenge you a little further. It's not like a soldier in today's army. You have to go back to the culture in which this was written, in which this was lived and experienced. So when it says a soldier followed his captain, it means that his captain was going through dangerous terrain to reach to the enemy. So it would normally encompass long marches, through hostile environments to fight this battle. So when Jesus leads you to places you don't want to go, will you still follow him? When his life takes you, following him, takes your life to circumstances you don't like, will you still follow him? All right, second one. It is often used of a slave accompanying his master. So yes, if you follow Jesus, he's the master, we're the slave. But what does that mean? Wherever the master goes, the slave is ready to attend to him. Always ready to spring to service, to serve, to carry out whatever the master wants. He is literally at the master's beck and call. But here's the beauty of this. The Christian is a slave whose joy it is to always serve Christ. So it's not like that slavery because we have been painted one picture of slavery. There was, there was slavery in the time of Jesus where when you owed money, you would sell yourself to pay off your debt. You all understand that? That's not like that they were willing to go into that arrangement. But the idea here is that your joy comes from knowing that you serve your Lord and Savior. So when we say, hey, are we following Jesus? Are you like a soldier following your, your commander into battles, into places you don't want to go sometimes? So when you want to explore the place of forgiven those who have done you evil and he says come let's have those conversations you decide to turn away Ooh, all right a slave accompanying his master do we have joy in our readiness to always serve christ or is serving god a chore or a task for us you see, if any time there's a conflict in the 
understanding of these things, it is more than likely we aren't following Jesus the way the word describes. Third one is often use of accepting wise counselor's opinion. So when you, when a man is, or a woman is in doubt, usually we will go to an expert. And if it's an area that we are not versed in, here's what we do. We accept that person's opinion, advice, etc. If you're going to build a house, you're expecting the contractor to lead you a certain way. All right, that's probably the wrong example in Trinidad. <laughs> that's probably that's probably the wrong example, but you all understand. If it's a field or area that you have no expertise in, you will depend on that person to lead and direct you, given that you trust them, all right? Given there's a relationship. The Christian is the man or woman who guides his life and conduct by the counsel of Christ. So in other words, when we read scripture, it's not optional for us. If I'm following Jesus, if his word says it, I'm going to do it. Mm. You see, we have people all across the church of Jesus Christ professing we follow him, but we still want to do life our own way. We want to do life how it's convenient for us. We want to still be in control. So, a part of us, for some of, for some of you, it, it is this way. Eh? We will serve God as long as we think he will give us what we want. So I'll serve you. I'll give up my time, my treasure, my talent. As long as I am guaranteed or at least I believe you are supposed to do this for me. What if serving God meant living a life where you did not get anything that you wanted, would you still? Would you still? Because the main thing has exited our mind a long time, you know. We look at the world and we can talk about crime. We can talk about corruption. We can talk about all the evil in the world. But humanity's greatest problem is sin. And the fact that we will stand before God. And we have to answer before God for that. And for those who don't have a relationship with God, they will spend an eternity away from Him. In pain and suffering and in torment. You want to know if you really come to church? we stop talking about that, right? We stop preaching about the reality of where we all going to face. And so if you're not, that's why this type of message is so important. Because many of us will say we follow Jesus, but we ain't truly following him. We will say we walking after the God of light, but there's darkness in our hearts. Because he doesn't say forgive them if they change, you know. He says forgive them because I forgive you. That ain't optional and that's not a suggestion. I know why I keep coming back to this forgiveness. We have some people who's taught in here probably. And like I'll make fun of that. But I know there are real situations in your life that probably destroyed a good part of who you are. You probably made decisions. Some of you wrestling with trying to forgive yourself. But that's where you don't have the concept of who God is yet. That while you were still a sinner, while you were an enemy of the cross, the Bible says, he died for you. Yeah, and you can't explain that. You ought to wrestle with that for the rest of your life. But you got to learn to accept his love for you. That is the marvelous light that pulls sinners like me and you out of darkness. Even when we don't deserve it. Especially when we don't deserve it. Come on, you with me? All right, four and five is often used 
of giving obedience to the laws of a city or a state. So think about this in Trinidad. While our country is marked with so much darkness and evil, we still have a beautiful nation. Our people are some of the most beautiful people you can find. But we allow things like politics to separate us. We live with racism that we accept and tolerate and even train our children to, to practice. But our land can still be beautiful. But think about this. For you to be a good citizen of Trinidad and Tobago means that you would obey the laws of the land. Because the law not only protects you, but it protects the society at large. So we learn how to speak and treat others in this land. Well, when it says you follow Christ, it is the same picture. That if you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, then you are obeying his commands. And too many of us, again, we treat the kingdom of God, the laws that should be governing our lives, we treat it like opinions. Or like we can pick and choose what we obey and what we listen to. I know this message is not one that might feel good at first, but come on. God wants, to, God wants to deliver us out of this hot and cold life we've been living. Come on, are you with me? He wants to break free uh, the scales from our eyes that we think in. We live in this righteous and holy life. But we're only playing games still. And the problem is we comparing ourselves with darkness in this world. So, so we feel good that my darkness ain't as bad as that person known. But you got to understand, your darkness going before the light of God. And in him there is no darkness. So if there is any darkness, we, found, we will be found guilty. Last one is this often used of following a teacher's line of argument or following the gist of someone's speech. So unlike my preaching, <laughs> some of you don't follow, right? But, but listen, it means that oh, we've all been there. You sit down in a place, a lecture, a classroom, even in churches. Let's be straight. I need make, I'm not just making fun of it, but the reality is you've sat down in a place where someone is speaking and your mind not there. To follow Christ is to hear his word and respond to it. It's to, to, to receive it with understanding, with almost an intentionality to say, okay, this is the time we set aside to hear God's word. I ain't going to let anything distract me. And when the thoughts come in to pull you to remember what going, you're going to face in the week, you rebuke it, you cast down every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. But some of us can't even reach there because we can't even reach in church. I saw you online. <laughs> no, but it's the truth, right? Cultural Christianity is so weak that we had to be debating if we come to church or not. And then we want to profess we followers of Christ. And some of his simple commands is, hey, don't forsake the assembling of the saints. When Paul talks of the New Testament church, was always in community. Ouch. Ouch, because we made, we've made following Jesus, well, at least we want to follow our Jesus that we're comfortable with, not the one in the Bible. So when he says, do you follow me, it means that you give up your rights and your life because you are now slave to the master. Oh, man, I'm sorry if someone preached and taught you that following Christ was for your good. No, it was for your salvation. But it meant that if you are truly saved, your life belongs to him. You can't be claiming your life belongs to him and you want to do everything else your own way. Then the truth is not in us. Hmm. That's why in Luke 9, 23, he says, If anyone wants to come after me, he must do what? Deny himself. Take up his cross and do what? Follow me. So the question is there again. Are we truly following Jesus? Or are we just coming to a church and we coming into a place 
where we feel comfortable. You know, when I was preparing this, even this morning, and I need to shout out this couple. I need to shout them out. See, I real, my mind bad, you know, I watching things here that I need to clean and I just get distracted. I real bad with this, y'all. <laughs> the music didn't help there, girl. Set the mood, right? <laughs> Listen, we have this beautiful couple that is a part of our church, but they had to leave. They went back home. Shout out Nathan and Janiel. We love you guys. We miss you all. We know what's so, and I'll say this publicly because they're not here. They're not in Trinidad again. Because if I'd say this when they were here, they'd probably rebuke me and be upset. But they've gone through so much difficulty. Not my place to share what they went through. But they would come, they would come to church every Sunday, every connect group, traveling. Now, if they get a ride, they get a ride sometimes. But they'll come traveling to church. And you and I prepare in this message and I'm missing them. You know why? When I, every time I saw them, it was an encouragement for me. Because I have some people who will give you every excuse. And you think this is about church attendance or numbers? It is so far from that. It is from every time I hear people talk about, hey, yeah, Jesus is my Lord. But you can't even give him your time once for the week. Shots fired for you online who could have been here and you chose not to be here. Because something else was more important. See, we don't want to hear that, right? Jay, if you want to keep the people, you had to make them feel comfortable. No, the word cuts. And if you say you are in the light but you have darkness, then we lie. And we've put everything before God. But there's this couple who've been through hell. I ain't even joking with you. Been through hell. And they will come sacrifice and show up every single week. I weep when they left, you know. Because they used to encourage me. Because sometimes when I hear the church of Christ and some of the reasons that we can't even commit just one day for the week for him. Yeah, you see, I'm going to preach straight now. Because you ain't, you want to say you following him, but you ain't want to take up a cross. You can't even deny yourself. Ooh. John spoke about us before Jesus revealed he was like. John chapter 3, verse 19 to 21. And this is the judgment. That the light has come into the world. And the people love the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light. And does not come to the light. So that his deeds will not be exposed. Stop making excuses about the church this and the church that. The real reason you don't want to commit it's because you don't want what is inside of you to be exposed. That's why we have a generation in this time and age where we have church goers, but we ain't have followers. We don't mind following each other on Instagram and social media because that's what we think is following. But I ain't following our Christ. Not coming here once and just talking about Christ and maybe I amen and show your face. That's not following him. That's how low the standards have reached in following Jesus Christ until he's Lord over every day of your life. Until he begins to consume who you are, what you want, until your goals and your vision align to what he wants. You aren't following him. You call him master, but you don't do what he says. So when he says, I am the light of the world. He is. By testament of John here. 
The reason we reject the light is because we love the darkness instead. And my job today is to hopefully force the word to confront you as it will confront me. Because there still is darkness. There still is darkness in my life. And this moment, just too serious, they make a joke about that. But the reality is, every single one of us, we fight our battles. But until you are willing to let the guard down, until you're willing to let somebody come and walk alongside you, remember what the word described? That when you walk in the truth and in the light, we get fellowship with one another. So it has to begin with you and I admitting there's still some darkness in our lives. No matter how long we've served God. A.W. Toza said, it is either all of Christ or none of Christ. I believe we need to preach again a whole Christ to the world. A Christ who does not need our apologies. A Christ who will not be divided. A Christ will, who will either be Lord of all or will not be Lord at all. That is the Christ of the church. I'm not trying to get you to come into church. You know, you're already here. But I need you to understand how far we've gone. That he's not Christ over everything. And I believe that that old time pastor, A.W. Toza, theologian who says, if he's not God of everything, he's not God at all. To follow Christ means to give everything to him. And how do you know when you're walking that way? You'll have fellowship with one another. Nadi, good morning. How are you going? Blessed, highly favored. You'll have fellowship where you could actually take the mask off and say, I need help in this area. And it's not condemnation. It is the conviction of the Spirit of God because He wants to bring freedom. He's the light of the world. There is no fixing humanity's problems without addressing the darkness of sin. And if there's sin in our lives, we've got to admit that. There is no other God, no other source of light. When Jesus said that he was the light of the world, he still is the light of the world. And guess what? He'll be the only light of the world that is to come. But the vision that I have for our community, for you today, when preparing this, it's not just that you would recognize that there is darkness still. Not to recognize that we're not following him how we say we want to follow him. But there's a beautiful thing that happens in the church. Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. But then he looks at his disciples his believers, his followers, and says, you are the light of the world. I serve a God who can take the brokenness in my life, take the darkest places and spaces, do the hard work, the painful work, but he could shine his light so bright it doesn't just dispel the darkness. But it causes his light to shine through me. Jesus said, you are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. The apostle Paul talking to the same church. A little bit lower down in chapter 5, verse 8 to 9. He says, you were once darkness, but now you are light of in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Hope City, my fam, my friends, walk as children of light. 
That is what God wants for you and I today. Not for us to struggle and keep that darkness. That's why the enemy isolates us. He keeps us by ourselves. Because you know the moment you let someone in that space, that darkness has no power over you. We go to God for forgiveness, but we go to each other for healing. James says, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. Whatever the enemy has done in your past, whatever he has caused you, some things you've even done, it's time to be healed. Your God has already forgiven you, but you will not break the power of it standing by yourself. I pray for us as a church. Verse 9, for the fruit of the light consists of goodness, righteousness, and truth. May that be the way the world sees us for those who are followers of Christ. Psalmist says, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Well, guess what? You are called to be the goodness and mercy for someone in your life. You think this darkness is to just keep you locked there? No, it's because God has called you to carry that light into the world. To push back the forces of darkness in your family, amongst your friends, your co-workers, the people that you love. We could talk all day about how they're good to you and so, but you know in the back of your mind that that darkness in their lives is going to cause them to be separated from God. But before we can do anything or ask anything or to help anyone, we got to address, are we living in spiritual darkness? Are we truly following Jesus? Maybe you've been in church for a long time. But in this short time together, you know to yourself that there are things God is touching in your heart that you know He's been trying to get your attention about. And this one came up all through the service. Maybe it's forgiveness. Maybe there's someone or some people that you need to let go of. Today is your chance to say, God, I'm tired of pretending to be in the light. It's time. It's time to step into the fullness of God's light and break the powers of darkness over our own hearts. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me just pray for us. You may be here today and you may be trying to find your way back to God or maybe you've been struggling with this faith trying to understand but this is the faith that we preach and this is the good news that every single one of us we see the darkness all around our world but there is darkness in each and every one of our hearts we were born in sin and the wages of sin is death that death is not physical death alone it is eternal separation from God but when Jesus said, I am the light of the world, he was making a declaration that the darkness in you, I can push back. I could illuminate the darkest of your past, of every choice you've made. I'll take it on. I'll take on your darkness, your sin, your evil, your wrong. If you'll trust that I am who I say I am. Not just bread of life, not just light of the world, but I am the Son of Man, Son of God, perfect in every way, sinless, God who came in the flesh, but He didn't just come. He came and went to the cross paid for your sins, paid for my sins. Because he did that and he invites you and I 
to receive the work that he, do, he has done, to recognize him as Lord and Savior, to believe in your hearts and to confess with your lips, Jesus, you are Lord. You are God. If you wouldn't do that today, even if it means returning to him, maybe you did it once before, but darkness has engulfed your life. Today, Jesus is standing at the door of your heart and he's knocking. The only question is, will you let him in? Heavenly Father, we just thank you, O oh God, for your, your word and your love for us, O oh God. It is a struggle sometimes to understand how much you've loved us. But God, today I pray that walls that have been built up over the years are coming down. That God, we are receiving the fullness of the revelation of who you are. You are the light of this world, oh God. Not just to shine for us to come to God, but you are the light that wants to dwell in us, oh God. That you want to show forth your life through these lives. And so Father, for too long we've held on to some dark areas. We, we've still tried to keep control of our lives the way we wanted it. But this morning, God, we ask for your forgiveness. We say, Lord, we are sorry. We're sorry where we've ignored the, the, the unforgiveness, the bitterness, oh God. This morning, we say, God, we give it all to you. All our sin, all our wrongdoing, oh God. We receive the work of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Father, my sins are crucified today. All the hurts, all the pain, everything from the past, God. We surrender to you today. We confess and we profess, Jesus, you are Lord over our lives. And, and God, we recommit our lives into your hands today. That we will be like good soldiers following you. We'll be like slaves who rejoice, oh God, to do what you want. To obey your word and your commands, oh God. That Father, from this day, when we say we follow you, it will be with new revelation. It will be with new commitment. It will be with new devotion to you, oh God. Father, for every person here, let the, let the heaviness of their past and their sins be removed in Jesus' name. That, Father, today you are making us brand new as a church, as a community, oh God. But especially as individuals, that we will follow you all the days of our life. God, myself included, that I would live a life that would be lived for you, oh God. That on that day when I face you, I will hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Father, let this be the outcome of every person in this house and those even online. That we would be the true church of your son. We will be your bride that you have longed for. That you are washing us with your word. You are removing every spot and wrinkle, oh God, from our lives. We receive the finished work of Jesus Christ. And we receive by your word that today we are made brand new. We thank you today. We give you all praise. That Father, you are not just saving us, but you are redeeming us, oh God. That we will be like that city on the hill. That we will be a light for others around us. We'll be a light for you on this earth. What greater joy that we get to represent you, God. Thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your grace, for your power to save. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, put your hands together if God has done something in your life